All right, we are recording the meeting. All right, well, I hope everybody had a good Christmas and uh, the new year. Hopefully it all smooths out here, especially with COVID. I know we have quite a few cases coming coming in from day to day. So um, we are still looking for a treasure. So if anybody is interested or knows of anybody, please let us know. Um, our last meeting, last meeting was held on December 15th. Roger Harad with Matthews Boss presented on high voltage systems and safety that's needed to work on them. He was talking about the new bus that they have. Theirs is called Julie, which I thought was a really cool name. Um, I think he said it was 400 volts. The Cascadia system, which is a tractor, or like tractor trailer, is 700 volts. So we are dealing with a lot of voltage here. Um, uses a two-speed transmission. The air system, oh, let me let this gentleman in. Okay, just so you guys know, we are recording the meeting and it's gonna go to our YouTube channel for the people that just joined. It uh, uh, yeah, uses a two-speed transmission. All the air system is behind the rear wheels, which I thought was kind of neat. Inside the, the center is the high voltage. Um, orange lines were all the high voltage lines. So those are the ones that we're not really supposed to be working with unless we're certified. Um, they are lithium ion batteries and they operate best at about 70 degrees. So they don't like it when it's real cold or don't like it when it's too warm, but they do have a heater and, a, and they chill them. So they have a system set up to maintain the temperature. So they've obviously put an awful lot of thought into it. You have a, a light that comes on on the dashboard, which is a triangle with a little lightning bolt in it to let you know that you have a high voltage connection issue. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uses um, re regenerative braking, so, and it's on the drive shaft. So when you're slowing down, it's also bat, um, charging the bus. Says you'll get 50, to 85 mile on a run, which which would work for, you know, picking up kids, you know, your regular routes. The advantage to having the electric bus is less maintenance. The bus sets the rate of charge so that it won't overheat. Instead of the charger setting the rate of charge, it's the, uh, the bus decides what it needs. The charge rate is at 90 kilowatts. You can get a full charge. Let me admit, Mr. Rodriguez. You can get a full charge in about four to six hours. And again, it depends on the, uh, the charger that you have. There are three training levels to work on these. There's the HV1. And that's a one hour course and everybody needs it. It's in your shop so that they can work on just the basic stuff. There's HV2, which is a two hour course. And that's your normal maintenance. And then there's a HV3 that's high voltage components. And that is a, that is a three day course. So that's obviously quite intense. Um, eight year warranty on the batteries. And those, those were my notes for the last meeting. And again, I thought it was a really good meeting, a lot of good information in there. And I see that quite a few people have been watching it on the YouTube channel as well. And so today's presentation will be put on by Cody Shamrock with Leonard Bus Sales. He'll be presenting on DPF systems and after treatment. So with that being said, I'm going to turn the meeting over to 
Mr. Cody Shamrock. All right, morning. Let me get this uh, going here. Probably stumble through the first time. Let's see. Okay. What screen are you guys seeing? So I can't tell. I can see your presentation. Okay, full presentation, or do you see the sidebar as well? I see. I see the uh, full presentation. Okay, perfect. Does so everybody else everyone... see? The... Everyone else sees it. Okay. okay. Perfect. Excellent. So, and for for anybody else that just joined, we are recording this meeting, and we're going to post it to our YouTube channel. Okay, Cody, all you. All right. So this this topic, EGR, DPF, you know, we could talk for five hours about this and, and what's good and what's bad about it. Uh, I have a, a semi-condensed version here just for the sake of time. I'll try to hit some of the high-level points on things you should know, things you might not know. Uh, obviously, you know, we're talking electric, propane, gas. You know, there's a reason that we, we're having the conversations. Uh, diesel engines are good, but they've changed because of the EPA requirements. Uh, you know, used to think about, uh, you know, 20 years ago, your bus yard, you start up in the morning and you've got a cloud of black smoke hanging over everything. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, but the reason that's not the case is because that DPF and that EGR system is capturing all of that. So it's still there. It's just being handled differently and not released to the atmosphere. Uh, so we'll, you know, we'll kind of talk through some of that stuff here. So as far as exhaust system flow, uh, I want to make sure the slide did change, right? Before I get too far. Yes, no. Can't see anybody. Take uh, silence as a yes. So exhaust system flow, you know, obviously we have a turbocharger on a diesel engine. Uh, big thing is your air intake side there. There's a lot we could talk about on air intake maintenance, but we're going to kind of focus more on the, the back half of the turbocharger. So you've got uh, the exhaust system obviously is directly connected. Uh, the turbocharger's primary function is to, you know, not only build boost pressure for acceleration and power, but to change your back pressure in the exhaust system. So when the exhaust gases have the, the ability to exit the, the, the combustion chamber, it can go one of two places. It can either go down the exhaust stream, as you can see in the graphic there, or it can go back into the engine uh, to try and be reburned, basically. So what I often tell people is if you can smell fuel at the tailpipe, it means that there's unburnt stuff there that, that can be burned again or try to be burned again uh, to make the most use out of it. Sort of like wringing out a wet sponge. You know, the more you can get out of it, the better. So in order to allow that exhaust to flow where it needs to flow, uh, you need the turbocharger to kind of direct that system. So uh, there is a nozzle in the turbocharger that, that controls this, and I'll show you that here in just a second. So the turbocharger on the Cummins engine also is your exhaust brake. So even if you don't have an active exhaust brake, you can turn that feature on. And uh, as long as your bus has a turbo, which they all do uh, in the Cummins engine, uh, you will have an exhaust brake option available to you. So... Again, you've got two options for where that exhaust can go, either out the turbo, down the exhaust pipe, uh, out the back of the bus, or again, back through the engine itself. So right off the bat, you can immediately see why a plug DPF might become a problem. You know, we have exhaust gases that need somewhere to go. Uh, if the DPF is plugged up, you know, there's not enough, uh, there's a flow restriction. Those exhaust gases have to go somewhere. So in this case, they would start to basically back feed into the engine, blow through your piston rings uh, and begin to build your crankcase pressure, which is why you often will see oil leaks and such with, uh, with a DPF issue, especially on if you get into like the Max 4.7 product, which we all love to hate. Um, as far as the turbocharger goes, in the charger itself, there is a nozzle ring. And this is kind of a cutaway version. So the top left picture there, you're seeing a fully closed nozzle ring, and it's that metal piece right behind the arrows. Uh, the bottom right picture shows you what a fully open nozzle ring looks like. Uh, this is important because the, the position of that nozzle ring is what determines where that exhaust is actually going to go. 
So if I show you another picture here, this is the fully closed version. So with this, basically your exhaust gases are flowing through this area to go out of the bus and, uh, and down the, the tailpipe. If you fully close this though, you're creating a restriction in flow, which will force that exhaust gas to find an alternate route uh, to exit. So if this is fully closed at this point, you're gonna be sending the exhaust gases back through the engine, through the EGR cooler, through the EGR valve and so on. So basically you're just, it's finding the path of least resistance and we create that by closing that nozzle. Uh, and that is controlled by the turbo actuator, which is a, a component that can, can fail, uh, but there's a lot of ways to test that. So a fully open, uh, basically minimum exhaust manifold pressure. There's limited restriction, meaning that the exhaust gases can flow freely down the tailpipe through the DPF, DOC, and, and so on and out of the bus. So this nozzle is constantly adjusting back and forth and, uh, and you know, basically directing that, that flow of exhaust. So with that, you know, your exhaust gases are flowing through the turbo. Uh, we know that if we, we cut the tailpipe off, the exhaust gases coming out are pretty disgusting. You know, there, there's oil and, and buildup in there and that stuff will eventually make its way into your turbocharger. And we do see situations where they get carboned up and, and gunked up to where that nozzle ring can no longer function. And basically the bus begins to have trouble because the exhaust gases are basically being allowed to just run wild and go wherever they feel they need to go. So uh, the actuator itself, as I said, is what's controlling that nozzle movement back and forth. It's mounted on top of the turbocharger. Uh, there is, again, a, a likelihood that that will fail at some point. It seems like it's not an uncommon problem to have on the, the 6, 7 engine. Uh, what the bus can do, though, is or what the ECM will do is it's actually monitoring that uh, that actuator. So the computer can tell it open 70%, and then you can also monitor to see if it's actually open to 70%. So the computer is kind of watching to say, this is what I told you to do, and this is what you're actually doing. Uh, and that's often how you end up with a VGT code is when those two numbers don't align. You know, I told you to open 100%, you've opened 85%, why you know and so it'll probably throw a code for a vgt actuator fault or, or whatever so uh as far as turbocharger inspection goes and i'm covering this uh, for a couple reasons uh, a lot of times people will see oil in the turbocharger and immediately jump to the fact that the turbocharger is probably shot you know there's something wrong with it uh, the reality is that as long as your your run out and your end play is your clearances is okay in the turbo, the turbo is considered to be fine. It uses rings just like a piston. Uh, and again, if you check your clearance, like you see on the right side there, and then your your kind of end play as you see on the left, and those are within specification, it's assumed that your turbo is working the way it should, at least at first glance. So if you have oil in the turbo, don't condemn that immediately when you see it so the oil obviously has to get there somehow and a lot of times what uh, what happens is we've got let's say a plugged dpf or plugged egr ports or both and what happens again is those exhaust gases have to go somewhere so the easiest path to escape for them ends up being the crankcase so the gases begin to fill the crankcase pressure begins to build and so on and there is a turbo oil drain to crankcase as well, or rather turbo drain to the, the crankcase. And what happens is the pressure builds in the crank and it begins to work its way up the turbo drain and fill the turbo with that oil and with that stuff from the bottom of the oil pan or in the crankcase. And uh, it will basically begin to spill it out of the turbo itself. So if you're seeing oil in your turbo in excess, there's a pretty good chance that you've got a blockage somewhere in the system that is causing an increase in crankcase pressure. So that could be as simple as a crankcase vent filter. It could be DPF, it could be EGR valve, EGR cooler, and any number of different things. The pre-2021 Cummins engine requires that the crankcase vent filter get replaced every two years or 75,000 miles, whichever comes first. So every two years, you should be replacing that uh, to keep the engine in, in healthy operating condition. 
2021 plus, they've changed to a closed system, or I shouldn't say a closed system, but a non-serviceable crankcase vent filter where you don't actually have to change it. There's no interval any longer. So just keep that in mind. So the EGR valve itself, something that we're probably all quite familiar with at this point, uh, this is basically a secondary uh, gate, we'll call it. So you've got your turbo that's indicating exhaust gases need to go here. Uh, the EGR valve gets that stuff and then will open and close accordingly to feed in what is needed uh, to keep the engine running at its optimal level. So with that as well, you now add in the uh, intake air actuator. So you've got these three different parts that are working together to kind of allow the engine to run properly. The turbo, the EGR valve, and the uh, intake throttle actuator, which again is electronic. So these three are kind of communicating with each other via the ECM and working to determine the best blend needed for the engine to run properly. So we've got really dirty exhaust that we can use and, and extract the, the bad stuff out of it, the intake throttle actuator will kind of close off because we don't need as much fresh air. We have enough inside the engine that we can reuse and feed back through and try to, you know, again, wring that sponge out as much as possible. Um, that is fantastic in theory, uh, but the reality is the EGR valve, just like the turbo, is taking on all of the soot and junk that the engine burns that used to go out of the tailpipe. Uh, now it's being put back into the engine. Uh, again, in theory, in some applications, it works great. If you're an over-the-road truck, you know, going 70, 75 miles per hour for four hours nonstop, probably okay. Uh, if you're a school bus, which we all are, you know, begins to create problems and we start having conversations about gas buses or propane or whatever. Um, you can check resistance on the EGR valve. And just like the turbocharger actuator, there's a, a commanded position on this valve and an actual position on the valve. So uh, the computer is kind of monitoring to say, you know, are you listening to what I'm telling you uh, and can throw a code accordingly. So Again, there is a resistance measurement you can do on this. If it's greater than 15 ohms, it's assumed that the, uh, the motor itself is not functioning correctly. Um, so if you want to maintain this, and it's, it is recommended that you actually pull this off, you know, at, at some sort of interval. You know, don't wait until you have a problem. Uh, in some cases, I guess you don't have a choice, but, uh, you know, pull this off at a regular interval and do a really good inspection on the, the actual valve itself and the ports. So the ports down there on the right side picture, uh, they're probably, I don't know, let's say about the size of a quarter, maybe. Uh, by the time they get clogged up, you know, they're they're quite small. You know, they're to the point where you may put a pencil through there. Uh, and that creates a flow restriction basically in your exhaust gas. So again, it, it just begins to send all of that dirty stuff down the tailpipe instead, which the DPF is not exactly equipped to handle uh, in, in that level. So you know, pull this valve off, inspect it, clean it really well, uh, and, you know, discard the gasket and really just make sure that it looks to be in, in good condition. Um, they want you to use uh, carb cleaner to actually clean the soot and whatnot off of this valve. Um, again, you're going to have some carbon coating inside that's just normal operation. Uh, but if it's really built up to the point where it appears that it's affecting operation, you're going to want to uh, get in there and try to replace that stuff or, or rather clean that stuff out. Um, you know, you're, you're basically doing a little bit of uh, dental work on the inside of this thing, you know, get in there with a pick, pull out the soot, make sure things are operating properly and uh, you know, keep your bus running as best you can. So this is just a lot of, you know, what, how to clean, which is fairly straightforward. Um, you know, down in the port there, use a nylon or, or brass wire or brush, make sure that you get this stuff you know, really cleaned out before you put it back on the engine, use carb cleaner, blow it out with, with clean shop air. Uh, you don't want the contaminants and particles being fed back into the top of the engine because uh, that could create problems for us also. So once you've cleaned it, what you can do is, uh, you know, leave it plugged in, leave the motor on it and command it to actuate in Cummins Insight. And you should hear a pretty distinctive metallic uh, closing sound. Uh, and that basically indicates that it's free moving. It should be a very quick open close. Uh, if it's a very slow 
open and close, uh, you know that you've still got some buildup in there or potentially an EGR valve that's kind of beyond saving at that point. Um, and this just talks about that that on this slide here. So um, you know, just do your due diligence to keep things clean and operating as much as possible. Um, you know, I know sometimes you battle a little bit of, of warranty versus maintenance, and this is one of those where maintenance is going to hopefully save you headaches later. So as far as why, you know, again, we have failures of the after treatment when an EGR valve fails is it's everything that I kind of just said, you know, you've got dirty exhaust that's going uh, into now your, your DPF, DOC, SCR, and so on. And that system can handle it to a point. Uh, but there is a, you know, it's designed to, to assume that those exhaust gases are being reburned uh, back in the engine itself. So you can see on the left there a completely destroyed after treatment system. And that is, you know, oil, fuel, whatever, making its way down the tailpipe that, that couldn't be burned for one reason or another. So that's the, the the nickel overview on EGR valves. Again, this is we could talk for hours on this topic. Um, as far as after treatment itself goes, you know it's it's a fairly straightforward concept. As I said, we've got dirty stuff. We want to reburn it as much as possible. It's got to go through a few different steps to get there. However, so it leaves the turbocharger or the engine goes through the DOC, which is a diesel oxidation catalyst that basically is converting gases into something less harmful. Uh, DPF is then capturing particles, again, storing them and converting them into something less harmful. From there goes into your SCR or your mixer where the DEF is added and then uh, basically out the pipe from there. So um, I will go through roughly what this process looks like and kind of explain it to you. So um, one of the, the things that I've heard before, as I'm sure you've had, have heard also, is people wonder, well, when it's going through a regen, all it's doing is taking that stuff that's been holding it and basically dumping it out. And it looks that way. And in some cases, it is putting out some nasty stuff. But the idea is that the DPF actually converts the soot that's collected into carbon dioxide which is obviously not harmful. So it, it's able to convert that and send that out the tailpipe instead. Um, so during a regen, what's happening is the, the bus is actually dumping additional fuel into the cylinder during the exhaust stroke. And what that does is it basically generates extra heat on the exhaust side and allows that stuff to burn off. Uh, there's a few different types of regen. I know we talk about just regen uh, in general or forced regen. There's passive, and that is basically day-to-day -day operation. The exhaust temperatures are high enough as the vehicle is going down the road that all of the regen is just happening in real time. There's not really anything the bus has to do. You know, the exhaust is 600 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Um, the driver doesn't know any different. There's no fuel being injected. It's basically your exhaust system is hot enough to convert and take care of that stuff on the fly, and you really don't even know what's happening. Uh, an active regen would be while the bus is moving or stationary, uh, but this is when they begin to inject fuel into the engine itself or into the exhaust stream. Uh, and the idea here is that the soot is building up faster than it can be oxidized. So it needs to then force that bus to go into an active regen to try and keep that stuff from building up too heavy. Um, I'll get into it a little bit, but there are obviously parameters required before it can do that. And at times it can be extremely difficult for a school bus to actually meet that requirement. Um, stationary or parked regen is basically the bus has tried. It can not accomplish what it needs to. Now it's your turn to try and fix it. So user interaction required. Uh, you can do it with a switch in some cases or use insight um, on the IC bus, at least. On the right side, there is a parked regen switch. And a lot of times if you just hit that, it's gonna flash green at you. And that basically means that there's not a need for a regen at that time or some parameter is not being met. So you could have the bus saying, you know, parked regen required and you hit the switch and it won't regen. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, well, you're telling me you need it, but now you're telling me that you won't do it. And it could be that the exhaust temperature is not high enough to do it that way. So you have to kind of force it with insight um, and it gets a little bit complicated. So this, these next couple slides or four slides here are gonna explain kind of some of the logic in the ECM behind 
how they determine when regen needs to happen. And this is the part that a lot of people don't know or get very hung up on. So I'm gonna kind of stumble through this one a little bit just because there's a lot, a lot of wording. Um, basically, you have the ability to set your regen speed in Cummins Insight. You can tell the engine when it should regen and when it should not regen. So from the factory by default, at least on the IC side, typically they have it set to five miles per hour. Meaning the bus cannot regen below five miles per hour, but also the bus will not begin to regen until it reaches 40 miles per hour. So anytime you set that minimum above zero, the bus can't regen until it reaches 40 miles per hour. The problem with that is you're probably recognizing pretty quickly is that there are plenty of bus routes out there that will never even reach 40 miles per hour on an average morning or if they do, it's for a very brief period of time. You know, they, they do their neighborhood pickup, they jump on Route 27 and they continue down there for two miles and then they turn left into another neighborhood. So you've got that sort of thing um, that's, that can be a problem. So again, you've got to hit 40. Now, this kind of shows you there where your regen starts and where your regen stops. So we're going down the road, we exceed 40, great. Regen has started. We're down below five miles per hour because we're at a student stop. Regen has stopped again. You know, and now I'm going stop, to stop, to stop, maybe going 30 miles an hour, 35 miles per hour. The district I used to work in years ago did door to door for every kid. And you would stop at five houses in a row in a cul-de-sac. You know, it was, it was a pain. Um, and obviously for regen purposes, not ideal. So again, you've got to reach that 40 to hit your start threshold. If you're on the highway, you know, we tell drivers all the time, take it and run it, you know, take it down 90 or 87 or whatever route you prefer, run it for a while. The logic behind that actually is keeping the bus above 40 miles per hour to allow it to regen as long as it needs to, to get the exhaust hot. So, so a lot of us will tell people to do that, but we don't actually understand exactly why we know what we're trying to accomplish but we don't exactly understand why we have to do that. And that's because the computer is set in that way, potentially. The other side of that is if you set the regen value down to zero, the bus will start regening anywhere from two to three miles per hour and will continue to regen regardless if it needs to. So you set that parameter to zero, again, it will continue to regen as long as it needs to, whether you're at a student stop, whether you're on the road going 20, 30, 40, it doesn't matter. It's going to regen as long as it needs to. Uh, so that is the ideal setting and something that we will typically change a bus to, uh, to make sure that that can happen as often as possible. But it's something you can check uh, and, and really verify that that's, what's, that's what your setting is. So our bus now uses a single can after treatment. It's all the same system as it was before. It's just a little bit smaller now. So it's 70% smaller, lighter. And the idea with the condensed system is that it's got uh, you know less surface area for air, cold air and such to touch it. So you've got enhanced thermal efficiency. You know, it stays hotter basically is the idea. Uh, as far as components go, this will be true OEM supplied, whether it's Bluebird, Thomas, IC, whatever. Um, Cummins supplies so many parts. Cummins doesn't know exactly what particular application that engine is going to go into. It could be going into a school bus, a delivery truck, fire truck, you know, airport, uh, de-icing truck. It has no idea what that engine's going into. So they basically hand you a package and say, here, these are the other things that you're going to need to make this work. It's your job to figure them out. So the OEM will supply a lot of the DEF tanks, filters, sensors, relay valves, and so on. Um, all of that sort of stuff to, to continue engine operations. So uh, just know when you're ordering parts or trying to figure out who owns what. You know, a lot of times the, the OEM has to supply a bunch of the, the after treatment componentry. So your after treatment itself has four sections to it and you can actually take and spin them from each other. They're all independent. And you've got your DOC, as I mentioned, your diesel oxidation catalyst at the left there, your DPF, which is the one we get hung up on the most your decomp mixer, which is basically just a wall that is uh, breaking up the exhaust, and then your SCR or your select catalyst reduction. 
So just a flow here, you can see your DOC at the, at the left side, excuse me, your DPF, your mixer, and then your SCR. So with this system, obviously we've got a lot of sensors on board. And you know, one of the things that we need to know is we've got that turbocharger that's trying to make a decision for us on how to direct that exhaust flow. It has to get information from somewhere. So you've got sensors in your uh, exhaust stream that are going to tell the turbocharger how dirty or how clean the air is. So you've got an inlet exhaust uh, gas temperature sensor and, uh, and also a NOx sensor that's going to be right at the beginning of the system. And that is reporting back. This is what I'm seeing as it exits the bus and goes to the after treatment system. It's very much like an O2 sensor in a car or your gas bus, you know, that first O2 sensor, its job is to report how dirty it is, you know, what's coming into this, this system, how dirty is it? And then your post O2 sensor is what's basically telling the ECM, yeah, the catalytic converter is doing its job, you know, keep up the good work. Um, this works very much the same way. You know, we've got dirty exhaust coming in, it reports back to the ECM, the ECM says, okay, turbocharger, actuator, uh, you know, make some adjustments so we can clean this up. And it's constantly monitoring that. Um, so you've got sensors all along the way. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we go here. So the particulate matter sensor is, uh, it's at the outlet side of the SCR. So right at the end there. And uh, they used to allow you to buy individual parts, but somebody in parts world, uh, has decided that uh, you know you have to buy it as an assembly now, which is kind of a pain, but it is what it is. And what that does is that's measuring soot emissions as it goes through. So that can kind of determine at the very end there, you know, how clean is this exhaust? How well is this thing working? Do we have a high level of soot or is it a very low level of soot? And it can kind of determine health of the system using that information. Um, so the way it differentiates between the different types of contaminants is that the sensors are made up of different materials. So one material may react with the soot while the other may react with carbon monoxide. And it just depends on the metal that's used in the sensor. And that's how they kind of differentiate between the two. So again, it's added in 2016 and it's uh, at the, the catalyst outlet basically. And that would be an indication. Let's say you think back to that picture with the DPF had a giant hole in it. You know, all of a sudden your uh, soot readings go way up high and that tells the computer, hey, something's not right here. We're going to throw a code and we're going to put you in D rate because why not? So your after treatment NOx sensor, again, this is, there's an inlet sensor and an outlet sensor. They are different. Uh, the idea with these is check the air that's coming in, make an assessment. The post NOx sensor or the, at the very end is your kind of how'd we do checkup point. At that point, it's, it's the review stage. So it uses these two to communicate and determine that the system is working properly. Um, at this point, again, it's pretty obvious why gas engine is a lot simpler. We have 402 sensors and that's about it. Um, with this, there's a lot more going on here. So intake temp sensor, again, you used to be able to buy these individually, but now you've got to buy the whole assembly. So there's four of those plus the module. And basically these sensors communicate back to that module. That module sends the information off to the ECM to make changes. Um, the temperature is important because if the exhaust is not at 600 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, we can't go into a proper region at that point. So you've gotta be able to monitor your temperature and, and see that things are working properly. The other benefit to it is if it's really hot on the backside and really low on the outlet side, we know we might have a backup in there somewhere. You know, we should have a more even temperature through this system than what we do. So I won't take much on this one here. 2013 and 14 only, there was an ammonia sensor. Uh, it was actually removed. And I, I think there was actually a campaign at one point to disconnect or remove it as well. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. Differential pressure sensor. Again, this is, we've got a ton of pressure on the backside of the DPF really low pressure on the outlet side, that tells us probably that we have a clog somewhere. You know, something is not quite right here. There should be a slight difference, but it shouldn't be that extreme. Uh, same thing as if that DPF is blown through with a hole and your pressure is equal across the board, we know something's wrong. So these pressure sensors are what's 
kind of monitoring that system generally. Uh, as far as dosing goes, you know, we've got DEF uh, as a required uh, component now or, or required fluid to keep the exhaust system clean. And that's just spraying a mist of DEF into the hot exhaust stream. And what it does is it's con converting the stuff that's in there into something less harmful is the idea. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the actual dosing part here. We did change the, the dosing valve in the last few years. You can check them for functionality. If you have Cummins Insight, what you can do is actually pull the dosing valve off and you put it in a beaker. And you think back to science class, you put it in a beaker, you command the test. It'll run for, say, three minutes. And they're going to ask you at the end of three minutes how much fluid is in this beaker. And if it's within a certain range, we know that your, your uh, doser is good. If it's not, then we know that you've got another issue somewhere. So uh, there's different easy tests that you can do with these. And Cummins will walk you through that stuff or Insight will. Um, so in order to dose, you've got to be above 392 degrees at the inlet and the outlet side. Um, no active faults. You have to have DEF and the DEF itself has to be above 37.4 degrees. So we have, and I've had, I know we all experience this drivers that like to go out and start their bus and then come back inside to the break room and drink their coffee and, you know, talk, whatever. And the bus sits there and it idles for a half hour. So kind of like a gas engine when it runs in open loop, the idea is once those O2 sensors hit 600 degrees, it needs to go into a closed loop operation in order for the computer to be happy and to not throw a code. This kind of works the same way. We start, we start the bus, we are monitoring the exhaust and the system says, hey, we need, uh, we need to begin dosing because you know, the exhaust is dirty. And the computer says, well, that's great, but the exhaust isn't hot enough yet. And the DEF is still too cold. We can't do anything with it. So the bus sits there and runs and runs and runs. And all that black smoke that used to be hovering over the bus yard is, again, being fed into the exhaust stream and being collected. So uh, it's important that the, the system is you know, allowed to be hot as much as it needs to be. Um, again, just a quick flow here. We do use... Uh, coolant to thaw the DEF. So again, if your bus is just sitting there idling, you know, the coolant's going to get warm, but it might not get warm enough to actually thaw that DEF if it's frozen or at least bring it up to the temperature that it needs to be. Uh, there is a pretty good argument for having buses plugged in because now you've got uh, a bus that can begin to go into that regen process sooner uh, or dosing process sooner than it could have otherwise. So Quickly here, uh, purge state on 2017 and older units, you'll hear when you shut the key off a, a kind of motor running for about 15 minutes. And that is a, a valve or the, the DEF uh, module purging all of the DEF out of the lines and sending it back to the tank. So problem with that is if you interrupt that system at any point, uh, you can throw a light because it wasn't able to complete its cycle. So driver gets back in the morning, they park their bus, you know it's back, you go out and you grab it 10 minutes later, it's still in the purge state, you start it, and now you may, may cause a, an issue in the system where it says, you know, we have, you know, our purge state was interrupted, what's going on? Um, and then you pull it into the shop, you park it, you, you know, fill out your paperwork, do whatever you gotta do, start it again, and again, you've interrupted the cycle and now twice in a consecutive, two consecutive key cycles. So you could potentially be causing, you know, fault codes that way. Um, so again, it's heated and cooled by the engine coolant. Uh, if it drops below 23 degrees, the DEF, the coolant control valve will be commanded to open by the DEF controller to warm that up. So let's see here. Oh, this is a coolant flow valve. Um, we've had some issues with these where they stick open. And what happens basically is you boil the sensors in the DEF tank to the point of failure because you're sending hot coolant routinely through the DEF tank. So that's something that can happen. I think we're on the third or fourth version now and it seems to have fixed the problem, but uh, that's something to just keep an eye on. Just a quick look at flow here. And I'm gonna keep rolling for the sake of time. Uh, there are some inspections you can do on these components. So what I tell people often is if you've had an oil leak or you've had oil in the turbocharger or you have you know replaced your your EGR cooler because it failed. Keep in mind that everything in that engine has to go somewhere eventually. 
So it probably made it to your after treatment system ultimately. So it's not a bad idea to kind of reverse engineer that and take apart the after treatment every so often. Again, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it might save you a headache later. Um, if you've got damage on components in there, it may indicate to you a problem somewhere else in the engine that has not gotten bad enough yet to present itself to you. So you can look at a new DOC inlet and outlet and see that it looks great. You know, obviously after a few miles of service, it won't look that good, but that's what a new one's going to look like. If you've got melting, like you see here on the DOC, which again is the first section of the uh, after treatment system, you could have excessive fuel or oil in the exhaust. And if you see that, that could tell you, okay, why do I, why do I have oil in my exhaust, first of all? And secondly, why do I have fuel in my exhaust? Do I have a leaking injector? Do I have, you know, what is, what's the situation? You know, so kind of work backward and start to figure out, okay, what's causing this? Um, much like a catalytic converter, they don't just quit. They're usually murdered by something. Uh, and this is the same way. They, they don't just stop working. They're only, they're being spoon fed garbage is what happens. And they need, you know, they need something better to eat. Um, face plugging. So you've got high amounts of soot. You know, you're going to see stuff like that. Um, again, understand why that's happening, what's causing high amounts of soot. Gouging, you know, think of like the fins on an air conditioner. It's kind of the same thing. If you press on them, they, they flatten down, sort of the same idea here. Uh, nothing deeper than an eighth of an inch. If they are, you got to replace that DOC at that point. So, again, you've got to figure out what's causing it. And some of the common things are coolant entering the exhaust, which could be a failed EGR cooler. Uh, following coolant fill procedure is a big deal. If you get air trapped in there and that cooler fails, you're going to destroy the after treatment system. Uh, light duty cycles, so school bus, low exhaust temp, school bus, uh, or a, combust a combustion malfunction, which creates excessive smoke. So just know that you can kind of work backwards uh, as a matter of routine maintenance. Uh, your DPF, the, the interval is laughable. They say clean it every 30 months or 6,500 hours. Um, if you get that far, most of the time, it's not worth cleaning it. It's sort of like cleaning a paint roller or a paintbrush. You can get it pretty good, but it's never going to be like it was when it was new. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, there's, there's good, uh, there's, you know, there's middle of the road. This is usable. Keep in mind, you know, this is, uh, this is collecting soot and that's what it's supposed to do. So you're going to have some of that. Um, same here. This is dirty and usable, but, uh, you know, just make sure that there's no major plugging inside of it. You've got your after cleaning version. Again, looks good, will still work, but over time it's going to begin to lose its effectiveness. And, uh, you know, it, it won't last as long as the original did. Uh, something with the DPF is it does begin to fill with, with ash over time as it goes through this process. So what happens is that ash begins to build up and that basically reduces the amount of usable space in the DPF. So you might, uh, you know, do a regen and then two days later it says, hey, we need another regen. And you think, well, I just did it. Uh, but the problem is you've got so much ash build up in there that, uh, you know, it just can't function the way that it needs to anymore. Um, again, check for gouges and so on. If you've got these kind of concentrated sections like this, this is excessive oil. And all of these images are available through Cummins. This is not something that I've, I've taken pictures of. Uh, Cummins... Quick serve online is great for this stuff. You know, look at look at your uh, DPF, and if you see that, you know you've got oil somewhere. So check your after treatment or your turbocharger outlet um, and after treatment inlet for oil. You know, and then work your way back from there and figure out why are we getting so much oil in the exhaust stream. Um, dark soot rings again. This could be excessive coolant, so either a failed EGR cooler or you know uh, something. Who knows something else? An issue deeper in the engine somewhere. Um, that's an indication of, of a coolant problem. And let's see here. So again, you're going to have some stains. Um, keep an eye on this. You can kind of, this will lead to cracking in the DPF if you've got these kind of really dark stains uh, inside there. Once they start to crack, it's like a brick wall with no mortar that's going to fall down eventually. So again, check for oil or fuel in your, in your exhaust system. So this is the outlet side of the DPF. So heading out toward the back of the bus, you know, if you've got excessive soot stains, again, you've got, there's a reason for it. It's being spoon fed something that it shouldn't be. 
an outlet here, you can see some face cracking, kind of those very fine fractures. That's how you end up with an image like I showed you earlier of a DPF that's completely blown apart. Uh, coolant staining, again, you kind of, you're getting the idea here of, of things that don't look right. Um, pull up QuickServe online, the accounts are free to make. You put in an engine serial number and it'll give you a ton of information, uh, pictures, troubleshooting symptoms, fault code sorting, you name it, it's, it's there. Obviously, a melted DPF, we've got a, a major problem. And in this case, this would be, you know, like a really bad fuel injector or something like that uh, is, is, you know, causing this. If you start to get to the point of, of this with oil alone, you've probably got oil leaks elsewhere anyway. So i um, not going to talk too much on that. I kind of did already. So as far as the comp mixer, this is the simplest part of the system that it Basically, the exhaust gases hit this wall and it kind of breaks them up and then DEF hits it. So it's it's basically just a, a fan of sorts that, that breaks the particles up, forces them to swirl around a little bit. DEF gets shot in there and then, you know, works its way to the SCR. So one thing to do is just check this, this canister out also. You know, if you have a driver that runs over a branch or garbage can or something and it slams into the... the the whole system there and there's a dent on the outside there's a chance that there could be damage done to the inside as well um, so just be be mindful of that or if they you know lay it over in a, a ditch or something like that you know sink off the road just be mindful of that sort of thing um again new scr looks good iron deposits are okay you know again this is capturing some of the stuff where it gets confusing is if i saw this on a dpf i might be concerned but because it's on an SCR, it's okay. So that's why I recommend using the images uh, to, to kind of check the system side by side. Um, again, DEF deposits, that's normal because DEF is being sprayed right ahead of this point and uh, it's getting caught on the inlet side of the SCR there. So uneven wear on the face, this is kind of sitting flat on the floor like a five gallon bucket and you put a straight edge on top of it. And if you've got more than an inch of wear on the outer edge, it indicates that the SCR probably needs to be replaced or if it's extremely uneven, it's probably getting worn out. And here lastly is uh, SCR with water staining or coolant staining. What I would say is if you see this on your SCR, you've got to remember that it went through the DPF and through the DOC and through the turbo before it got to this point. So I would definitely recommend you know, making a habit of checking your DOCs and DPFs and making sure that things are appearing to be in good working order. Um, so last couple slides here, uh, and this is just general knowledge. Uh, so you can share it with drivers that continue to ask the same question even after 15 years of this stuff. Uh, DPF lamp, basically you've got a clogged filter there is what it's showing you. It should be off, uh, but if it comes on, that basically tells you that you need to increase your duty cycle or do a stationary regen. In other words, it's getting clogged up. Those pressure sensors are warning you that something's going on here. Um, high exhaust temperature, basically below five miles per hour. This comes on to tell you that, you know, I've got hot exhaust, stay away from the back of the bus. As soon as you accelerate, that light goes off. So you'll get a driver that says it comes on, it goes off. That's what it should be doing. What I would tell you is if you have a driver that says this light is coming on, you know, once a day and now it's two times a day and now it's all day, you have a problem somewhere and you need to figure out what it is before it basically self-destructs. You know, it shouldn't be in regen that often uh, in most cases. So check engine lamp. If you've got this with a DPF lamp at the top there, uh, you need service. You are in D rate at that point. Of course, stop engine lamp is pretty self-explanatory, uh, as is your park regen switch that I explained earlier. So we're last last three two or three slides here, I think. Um, again, this is normal. If you watch that bar on the bottom, there's a little tick mark there next to empty. This would be normal operation. Things are good. Uh, as your soot load increases, you know you're going to get uh, an active regen as conditions permit. You know the bus knows that it's starting to get there. It's starting to build up. Okay, now we are regening because we need it. So that light is on. Uh, we get to this point, soot is building more. Now we know that we need to regen for sure. Um, maybe it can't for one reason or another. You've got a fault code, the triangle on the dash, and uh, the DPF lamp is on solid. Uh, you get to this point, DPF lamp starts flashing. 
Uh, that's when you start crossing your fingers and hope you make it back to the yard. Uh, some of you have probably found that you sometimes have 10 minutes between all is good and breakdown. And sometimes you have a half hour. Sometimes you have a day. There's no rhyme or reason to when these things decide that they're going to kind of zonk out, so to speak. Uh, lastly, again, you've got a check engine light here um, with the DPF lamp, you're in trouble. So, uh, and lastly is your stop engine, fairly self-explanatory. So again, that's the, the nickel version of after treatment for the sake of time. Um, you know, we, for people that, that work with us routinely, we do offer this in like a four hour format, but we'll, uh, we'll go with that. So if anybody has any questions, Hey, Cody. Yes. You said that you set the speed to zero so yeah. that it, it will regen whenever it needs to. Yeah. But if we set it to zero and the driver still is constantly using the brake, it's when you hit the brake, it's still going to shut that down, correct? It, not when you have it set down that low because you can set it to operate at zero miles per hour, basically. So it will continue to regen through a student stop, through a red light and so on. Um, and that's, you know, that system is designed for a truck, really, you know, where they're going to be going 40 plus most of the day. You know, in our world, we have to tweak that a little bit. And uh, like so we have people that we actually set it for down to where it can regen regardless whether it's sitting still at speed you know whatever um, i don't know if there's a, a standard across the state for it i would love to think so but i know that we have five locations with five you know different people doing different things in some cases so i'd have to check on that hmm. okay all right any other questions from anybody or thoughts Excellent. Hopefully I didn't take too long. No, I thought it was, I thought it was really good. How about the uh, deaf filter? There's the interval on that is like uh, 6,500 hours or 200,000 miles. I think off the top of my head, uh, I know of shops that do it as a regular part of their maintenance. I know of others that have never touched it. I know of some that don't even know there is a filter. So you get different, uh, different responses, but Cummins says 200,000 miles, 6,500 hours, or, you know, like, I don't, I don't know what the year interval is, but whatever comes first, basically. No harm in changing it. Okay, anybody else have any questions for Cody? All right, if you think of any, you know, shoot me an email, and uh, we'll make sure we post it to the, uh, I'll get the answer from Cody and we'll post it to everyone. Um, well, thank you very much, Cody, for your presentation. Again, you it was informative. It was really good. I thought, um, okay. Our next meeting will be held on February 16th. Our presenter will be Chad white with Warren tire. He's going to be presenting on tires and suspension. Um, it, again, we're going to keep with virtual. So this is going to be another virtual meeting. I'll be sending out the link. The uh, I got news that the summer seminar is going to be canceled this year. It's just we've had some issues and we're not going to we're not going to attempt to put together a seminar for this summer. So that's the latest news at this time. Um, on the positive side though, the capital chapter, we have our, our ASE certification set up. Now I wanted to announce the two winners, or two people that are gonna be uh, receiving the certification at the Christmas party each year. But being that we talked about it up until now, and we've been doing a lot of work on it, I want to get the ball rolling. So today I'm going to send out an email with George Giel's email address. That's who's going to, we're going to be sending, if you have a, a nomination from your garage, 
that you want to have become ASC certified with a master school bus, we will pay for this two people a year. We're going to start today taking the nominations. And in February 10th, we're going to stop taking the nominations. That'll give us a couple of days before our next meeting. That's when we will announce our very first two winners. And we'll go over how they can sign up, create their own account, and they can become master certified. So I think this is going to be a really good plan that we're putting together. I just said I don't want to wait till next year when we have all this year to go. So again, we're, we're going to start today and we're going to take uh, nominations until February 10th. And I'll put this in an email and send it out. And everybody can email George. We'll select the two people and we'll let everybody know at the next meeting. So it's a little bit of exciting news anyway. Does uh, anybody have anything else that they want to add to the meeting or any questions or anything? If not, um, I'm going to close the meeting today. Um, please remember we are looking for a treasurer. Um, we could really use one. We're uh, just going to kind of fill in until we get one. But um, all right, if you have any questions or anything, please let me know. Email me, text me, and uh, we'll get the questions answered. I want to thank everybody for participating in today's meeting. And at that, this point, I'm going to close the meeting. We'll see you guys in a month. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. All right, we'll see you later. Thanks, Dan. We'll see you later. There's our, okay, perfect.